ah, the sun is shining, it's a beautiful day, you've got your grease gun loaded, and just as you're about to pump some grease, you realize, hold up, is the grease that I'm pumping in the same as the grease that's already in there? I could end up with a grease compatibility problem. So from our previous lesson, we discussed the fact that there are many different types of grease thickeners, and we use them for a wide variety of applications. But let's say, for example, you want to change the type of grease that you're using. Let's say, for example, you are in a very, very high temperature environment. and You're looking for a little bit more high temperature stability. Maybe you're already using a lithium complex grease, which is pretty good at high temperatures, but you want to move to something like a calcium sulfonate, right? Now, what you need to do is you need to change greases. You need to move from a lithium complex to a calcium sulfonate. But here we run into a problem because maybe we don't have an opportunity to shut down the machine. And let's be honest, it's usually best practice to grease a machine while it's in operation anyway. And so we have sort of two main risks that can happen when we mix different types of greases. If we have an incompatibility problem, we can run into two main problems, one of which is that it thins out and it becomes effectively a liquid. That's a problem because now it's going to potentially fall out of the bearing and we have insufficient lubricant to protect our equipment. The opposite is that it actually hardens in surface and it becomes like a block grease almost. That is also equally bad because we can end up with things like seized bearings. So either way, compatibility is not good. Now you've probably seen something that looks a little bit like this. This is a compatibility chart widely seen throughout the industry. And your first kind of port of call is probably to go to one of these compatibility charts and check, okay, is lithium complex and a calcium sulfonate going to be compatible with each other? Now, I've got news for you. This is probably not the best way of doing it. And I think we should apply the best parts of cancel culture to cancel this particular chart. And there's some good reasons for it. First of all, when you look at all the published charts, they don't really tell you what kind of testing methodology that they used in the lab to determine the compatibility. The other thing is, if you go on Google and you type in grease compatibility chart and you go to an image search, you'll find a whole bunch of different images. The problem is that Rarely do they actually agree. If you go back and actually look at all the different grease compatibility charts, they often disagree with each other. Now, that could be because maybe the testing that they were using was different when they put the compatibility charts together. Alternatively, maybe they were testing different grease formulations. Because you've got to remember, when we're talking about compatibility, we're not talking about thickener compatibility. We're talking about specifically grease compatibility. If we're just discussing the compatibility of the thickener, remember, that's not really the overall picture. What distinguishes an oil from a grease is its thickener, right? Which can typically make up to anywhere, you know, sort of between 10 and 30% of the overall grease composition. So if we're talking about specifically the compatibility between two different products, let's say, for example, uh, one that's based on a lithium complex versus one that's based on a calcium sulfonate, we're restricting our conversation on compatibility to two very narrow areas. We haven't even discussed additive compatibility or base oil compatibility. Imagine if I gave you a result for the compatibility of two turbine oils, and all I was talking about was additive compatibility, and I never tested the base oils. You, you would say that that is a kind of an irrelevant result. So we're, we're doing the same thing here with grease compatibility. We need to move beyond just talking about the compatibility of the thickeners. Now, helpfully, the ASTM has a, a kind of outline for how we should do this testing. So ASTM D6185 helps give guidelines on testing grease compatibility. And generally what they say is that you wanna mix the two greases in two different proportions. So you might do 90-10 and then 50-50 and then 10-90. The idea being that most of the time when you see incompatibility problems, it'll happen around that sort of 50-50 proportion. But the 1090 and the 9010 help to simulate what happens when you're changing over, right? So when you're purging one grease and replacing it with another. So that's the idea behind it or the philosophy behind it. Now, the thing about this is that what what are you going to test? Right? You can't run an entire battery of tests to determine the compatibility. So as a screening method, what they suggest is testing dropping point, shear stability, and storage stability. Now, 
how would you expect this to look, right? Let's say, for example, I took, um, you know, in this instance, I looked up uh, 460 uh, Centerstoke, uh, a lithium complex grease, as well as a calcium sulfonate grease that were both NLGI2. And the dropping point for the lithium complex grease was 250, uh, 265 degrees Celsius, and the dropping point for the calcium sulfonate grease was 275. So if you were to draw a straight line between them, you would expect that you, as you increase the proportion of calcium sulfonate, you would expect that it would kind of match up on this line. If you didn't see that, and instead the proportions sat substantially below the line, that might be an indication that you have an incompatibility problem between the two greases. Now, this kind of testing is very, very commonly done across the industry. So often, if you are requesting to change between two types of greases, you'll usually go to the supplier of the new grease, because it's in their commercial interest to do so, and you'll say, can you do a um, compatibility test for me in the lab? Uh, maybe it's an independent lab, because you know, you want some independence there. They send you the results and they might say, yes, these two greases are compatible. Here's the thing. In that ASTM method, what it actually says is that these three tests which are done are only a primary evaluation method. You're not supposed to, you, this is not the be all and end all when it comes to grease compatibility. We're actually used to use this just as a guide, right? So if it passes all these evaluation criteria, we're supposed to move on to a secondary evaluation, which takes into account what kind of application is this going to be in. Is it going to be an automotive application? Is it going to be high temperature extremes? And the ASTM uh, method actually then outlines uh, a suggested battery of tests that we should subject the mixtures to, to determine whether it's actually going to be compatible over the long term. Right? One, of the, one of the sort of restrictions that we have around the primary evaluation test methods is that they're not done for a significant amount of time. And so it's very difficult to determine whether the greases are truly going to be compatible over the long term. Right? So um, what I would suggest if you are an end user who is swapping between two greases, um, have your supplier do these tests and get them to do the secondary evaluation as per ASTM. There are very, very few instances in which I've actually seen this kind of compatibility testing done. But if they want your business, they should be doing the tests. Now, the other thing that should be noted is that often oil companies will have kind of a library of previous um, compatibility testing that they've been done. And they might point you towards a previous test and say, look, five years ago, we tested the compatibility between these two greases that you're asking for, and we know that they're okay. Here's why you should ask them to retest. The fact is that maybe the manufacturing method for one of the two greases has changed, or maybe the additives for one of the two greases have changed. You have absolutely no control over any of those changes that have happened in the last five years, and so you should be demanding that your oil supplier redoes the test. If you found this content useful, head on over to lubrication.expert. It's a website where there's tons more training courses, they're more structured, and it's available for about 22 US dollars a month.